Today we continue our Lenten series uh, that is challenging and encouraging all of us to go deeper, uh, to become more deeply rooted in our faith uh, and in our relationship with God. And we find our focus for the morning in the sixth chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 25th verse. I invite you to follow along as I read our passage. Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? And who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. And God's people say, Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit and breathe life into the words of this servant that they might carry a word from you into our hearts and lives this morning. Amen. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. We hear that refrain several times in just these few verses of the passage today, and it's a, a refrain that seems to show up in other places in Scripture as well. But in the context of the world and the times in which we live, just to say the words, don't worry, can, can seem a little superficial or maybe even unrealistic. When we think about children in Nigeria, who are being kidnapped out of their classrooms, the threat and the danger is real. When we think about the terrorism that exists both there and even threatens us here and in places all over the world, the danger is real. When we consider the events just of the last two weeks here in our own state, the danger is real. It is not enough to just simply say, don't worry it seems in fact in the wake of the shootings at marjorie stoneman douglas there are things that we should worry about we say there are things that might even keep us up at night so it's important first then for us to set the context for these words that we hear from jesus today we can begin by looking at the Greek word in the New Testament that is used here. It is the word merimnau. Merimnau can be translated as worry or care or anxiety. It shows up in several places in the New Testament. And when we look at some of the other examples of where it shows up, it becomes clear that Jesus is not making a blanket statement as if to say there is nothing that should worry or concern us. We can go to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, for example. And there in the seventh chapter, when he is talking about how perhaps it would be better uh, in his context, he was thinking that it might be better for people to remain single rather than be married so that they could focus their attention on their life of faith. Uh, Paul says, the, I want you to be free from anxieties, and it's that word marim now. But then he says, the unmarried man is anxious, marim now, about the affairs of the Lord, 
how to please the Lord. And then when we turn a few pages later in 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, when Paul is giving us the image of the church as the body of Christ and talking about how we all fit together, he says that it is this way so that there may be no dissension within the body, but that the members may have the same care, marim now, for one another. Clearly, as we begin to look at these examples and others then, when Jesus says don't worry in this passage, it's not that he is saying that there is nothing that should concern us, that there is nothing that we should worry about or be anxious about. It's just that we need to be able to put our concerns and cares on the right things and to get our priorities in the right places. Continuing to set the context, we can look at what comes before these verses in that same chapter. There's several things that Jesus is speaking to and about and drawing attention to earlier in chapter 6, and all of them seem to be things that have to do with people trying to keep up appearances. Nobody here ever does that, I am sure. But people trying to keep up appearances. And so he talks about how to help the poor. Because apparently in his context, there were people who were doing it in a showy way where everybody would see how generous they were being so that they would draw attention to themselves. And Jesus says, don't do that. And then he talks about how we should pray, that we should step aside in secret and in quiet and pray and, and not try to be the loudest prayer or the, ones that, or the one that used the biggest or the most words. And then he talks about fasting. And apparently there were some folks in that day who were drawing attention to themselves while they were fasting by trying to put on as miserable of a face and appearance as they possibly could so that people would see them and know, oh, you must be fasting. And Jesus says, no, don't do that. And then he turns his attention to the way in which people's attention gets divided and they try to pay attention to a life with God while holding on to a life that is oriented around material possessions and wealth, gaining, acquiring as much as they can, keeping up with appearances. And in the middle of all of this, Jesus offers a model prayer. It is here in chapter 6 that we hear him give to his disciples and to us the Lord's Prayer as a model, a model for orienting not only our prayers, but our lives. And so by the time we get to the beginning of our passage today, all of this is in the background. All of this is part of the framework that sets us up for the beginning of verse 25. Therefore, now you all know if you're reading a document, a resolution, or if you're reading something or hearing someone speak, when you get to the word therefore, you're about to get to the, to the conclusion, the meat of the matter, right? So Jesus here says, therefore. And in these final verses of chapter 6, he is addressing all of the knots. That's N-O-T-S. All of the knots that get people all tied up and tangled in worry over the things that need not keep us up at night. There may be things that should keep us up at night, but Jesus is talking to us about the things that need not keep us up at night. So what are some of those knots that perhaps we need to name for ourselves? Well, in our context, I think a lot of them today are not enoughs. We think in terms of not enough an awful lot of the time. We have not enough to keep up or to be happy. Not enough car or not enough house, not enough boat, not enough land, not enough friends, not enough time. We worry about there not being enough 
for both you and me. And so I'm going to work to protect my little corner of the world, even if it's at your expense, because I'm thinking from a mindset of scarcity rather than acknowledging God's abundance. And so I think in terms of not enough for both you and me, and I'm going to come first. And then there are all of the fill-in-the-blank examples that we put on ourselves. Not blank enough. A few examples. We look at ourselves and we think, not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not handsome enough, not buff enough, not well-liked or promoted or accomplished or fast or funny enough. You can probably think of a few of your own that tie you up in knots at times. What is it that you would use to fill in that blank? Not blank enough that occupies way too much of your time and energy and concern and creates knots of worry. In talking about this passage and what Jesus is trying to say to us, one theologian says, what our hearts desire is to really count, to know that our lives really matter. And what happens far too often is what we do to ourselves is to tie ourselves up in knots worrying about the things that we think will make us count in the world, the things that we think will make us count in front of others. And Jesus looks at us and looks at all of that and says, don't worry. Don't worry about that stuff. And thank goodness he doesn't stop there. Have you ever had that person, maybe there's somebody in your life who seems to always be able to point out what it is that you should not be doing? Don't do that, or don't say this, or don't go that way, or they're happy to tell you all the knots. But then there's no positive suggestion about where to go instead? Thank goodness Jesus doesn't do that. So after saying, don't worry about that stuff, he looks at us and he says, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And in that moment, in the context of that Sermon on the Mount, in the context of all that he has just said, what he's doing is he is pointing us back to the prayer that just a few verses earlier he taught us. You all remember how that prayer starts. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. There it is. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. What we need is to begin by focusing on God and God's purposes, not our wants and worries and the stuff that we think that we need and we want. It's about the orientation, the basic orientation of life. So Jesus says, seek first the things that are of God. And then these things, and which things? These things will be added unto you. Not the things that we think we want, the things that we have thought would make us count, the things that we have been doing to try to keep up with appearances or to keep up with the Joneses, but the things that we really do need. And here again, we can, we can imagine Jesus pointing us back to that prayer. Because in that prayer, once we have said 
what needs to come first. God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Then he points us to basic needs that we can offer up in prayer. Daily bread. Not what we need tomorrow or a week from tomorrow or 10 years from tomorrow. Bread for today. We can pray for forgiveness because we all need that. And we all find grace and comfort in knowing that it is there for us. We can pray for the strength to face temptation because goodness knows we are all tempted on a daily, if not hourly, or moment-by-moment -moment basis. And we can pray to be delivered from evil because life is a journey full of choices and God is always inviting us to choose the good over the evil that we, we will be a part of what God wants to do in and through us and not steer off course based on some other person's ideas about who or what we should be. Now let's be honest. This does not happen instantaneously. It's not a matter of saying, don't worry, and then it's all done with, right? It's not a matter of a snap of the fingers. There is no midnight magic where we go to bed one night with all, all sorts of worries and we wake up the next never to have them again. But here's one thing I know. Here's one thing I have experienced at times in my own life, and here is one thing I hear Jesus telling us through these verses today. If you want to starve your worry, feed your faith. If you want to starve worry out of existence, feed your faith. Because the deeper we go in our faith, the deeper we allow God to walk with us in that life, the more we will know that God's grace is indeed sufficient for all of our needs. Eugene Peterson, in his translation, The Message, puts the final verse of this passage this way. So steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Get things in the right order. Seek first God's kingdom. God's righteousness, the things that are of God. And if you're not sure about where to get started with that, if that's not something you've ever really taken a serious look at or thought about or, or said, yes, that is what I want to do, let me just offer this as one way to start this week. I would invite you to read the letter to the Philippians in the New Testament. It is a short letter that's just a few pages long. Sit with it. Don't speed read it. Just read a few verses and let them sink in at a time. And then begin each day this week with a few moments of prayer. And in that time of prayer, spend at least as much time silent and listening as you do speaking. The deeper we go, the more we know of God's abundance, abundant grace that is sufficient for us. Put that into practice this week and see what God will do. Will you pray with me?
Oh God, God, may we lean into your grace. And may we find the strength that we need and the peace that we want that is sufficient for us all. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.